Here we go. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. Those who look to God are radiant, and their faces shall never be ashamed. Through Christ, we are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory. So our faith and hope are in God. The Lord redeems the life of his servants. None of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. We have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. Pray with me. Father in heaven, you are the Holy One, the creator of the heavens and the earth, the king over all things that you have made. Lord, we come to you based on what Jesus has done, our only Savior, who has made a way for us in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Continue to form us through your Holy Spirit, by which you are making us into a holy people, to declare your praise. And guide us now this morning, even as we pray the prayer you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Would you stand and sing to the Lord this morning?
be seated. In the Christian life, our obedience is a result of deliverance, not the other way around. Even in the Old Testament, the book of Leviticus, the giving of the law, comes after the Exodus, where God delivers his people from Egypt and sets up a tabernacle so he could dwell in their midst. In this way, the book of Leviticus still asks us an important question today. How should we live as God's holy people? And with this in mind, we come to our time of confession. So let's confess our sin to the Lord together. The Lord says to his people, You shall be holy, for I, the Lord, your God, am holy. But we confess that we do not live as God's holy people. We have not prepared our minds for action, but instead distract ourselves with worthless momentary pursuits. Our minds are not sober, but rather are soft with disuse and distraction. We too quickly revert to the passions of our former ignorance rather than renewing our minds in your word. And so we fail to love one another earnestly. Though we have been delivered out of darkness, we fail to love the stranger and the alien among us. We practice malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander, rather than putting all these things away. Help us, Lord. Teach us to long for the pure spiritual milk and to love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Children of God, you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. Therefore, our conscience has been purified from dead works to serve the living God. Praise the Lord. And will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we appeal to you this morning in the name of Jesus, your Son, who is the Christ, our Savior. Hear our imperfect petitions and requests through the intercession of his perfect obedience, sacrifice, and love for your people. Father, we are tired. We are tired of the pandemic. We are tired of the injustice in our country. We are tired of neighbors bickering against neighbors in a society that seems to be sliding further and further away from you and your gracious word. And like children, we are prone to whine and complain and even rebel against our Father in our exhaustion. Instead, let us simply turn to you and ask for your help. Help us, Father. Heal our world of the COVID-19 virus. And while we wait for you to do so, protect us especially protect our friends and family working near to this health crisis. Protect our first responders, nurses, doctors, food service providers, 
child care providers, and other essential workers. Work through your spirit to give us unity that we might work together instead of against each other to do whatever is needed to love our neighbors and keep our city, state, and nation safe from a spreading illness. Father, work a miracle in our nation that its citizens would experience more of your kingdom and its justice and equality rather than the fallen promises of liberty and justice for all made by a kingdom that cannot hope to keep keep them. Give us ears to hear the gospel and hearts to keep the greatest commandment, to love you with all our hearts and our neighbors, whoever you have created them to be as ourselves. Father, truly may your kingdom come, may it pervade every nook and cranny of our global society, and may it change how we live together and reveal your glorious truth. Let your spirit move in the world so as to end the confusion and rebellion of the fall. Father, help us to persevere in faith until you send Jesus to come get us, as, get a, get us as, at last. Help us to trust your sovereignty, your rule, and your presence in our everyday mundane lives, and to set our minds on heaven where moth and rust do not destroy. Finally, Father, we thank you for bearing with us thus far. Thank you for your patience, wisdom, provision, and love. Thank you for not casting us off long ago in the garden and for securing our place at your table through the sacrifice of your own son. The gospel is true. Remind us of it again and again and again. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. A reading from the law. The Lord, helps call, the Lord calls his people to a life of holiness, justice, and love because of his own character and his gracious redemption. Leviticus 19, verses 1 through 18 and 33 through 34. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to all the congregation of the people of Israel, and say to them, You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Every one of you shall revere his mother and his father, and you shall keep my Sabbaths. I am the Lord your God. Do not turn to idols or make for yourselves any gods of cast metal. I am the Lord your God. When you offer a sacrifice of peace offerings to the Lord, You shall offer it so that you may be accepted. It shall be eaten the same day you offer it, or on the day after, and anything left over until the third day shall be burned up with fire. If it is eaten at all on the third day, it is tainted. It will not be accepted, and everyone who eats it shall bear his iniquity, because he has profaned what is holy to the Lord, and that person shall be cut off from his people. When you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap your field right up to its edge, neither shall you gather the gleanings after your harvest. And you shall not strip your vineyard bare, neither shall you gather the fallen grapes of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor and for the sojourner. I am the Lord your God. You shall not steal, you shall not deal falsely. You shall not lie to one another. You shall not swear by by my name falsely, and so profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. You shall not oppress your neighbor or rob him. The wages of a hired worker shall not remain with you all night until the morning. You shall not curse the deaf or put a stumbling block before the blind but you shall fear your God. I am the Lord. You shall do no injustice in court. You shall not be partial to the poor or defer to the great, but in righteousness shall you judge your neighbor. You shall not go around as a slanderer among your people, and you shall not stand up against the life of your neighbor. I am the Lord. You shall not hate your brother in your heart, but you shall reason frankly with your neighbor, lest you incur sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. When a stranger sojourns with you in your land, you shall not do him wrong. You shall treat the stranger who sojourns with you as the native among you, and you shall love him as yourself. For you were strangers in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Amen. Well, welcome to New St. Peter's this morning, whether you're with us in person or online. Um, I want to direct your attention to the back of the bulletin. There are a few announcements there this morning about our women's summer small groups and also our youth group meeting tonight via Zoom. You can find more information about what's going on at New St. Peter's on our website. As another announcement, Titus Bagby, the RUF international pastor at Texas A&M, will be preaching for us next week. 
Um, and lastly, as things continue to change in Dallas, know that the session of New St. Peter's is taking it very seriously, continuing to consult with the children's theater and local physicians to understand best how to care for us as a congregation. And for now, plan on meeting like we have been, like this, but if anything were to change, then you'd be notified of that change. Now, because we have been ransomed by the precious blood of Christ, we have peace with God. Therefore, may the peace of the Lord be with you. Stand and share the peace with one another distantly this morning. Continuing this morning our series in the New Testament letters of Peter, and if this were a pre-COVID Sunday, I might make you stand here for some time and give you a more eloquent introduction to the text, but as Noah clocked in at about 25 minutes last week, I think I need to, to pick it up a little bit. And the introduction to this text is actually profoundly simple, so I'll keep it brief. Here's, here's what you need to know by way of review, before we read our text this morning, if you are in Christ, you have a new identity as elect exiles in this world, and you have a secure inheritance because of the salvation that has come to you in Jesus Christ. And as these things are true, they now shape every aspect of the Christian journey. And so this morning we'll read on page 5 of your bulletin, 1 Peter verses, uh, chapter 1 beginning in verse 13 and continuing through chapter 2 verse 3. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on him as father who judges impartially, according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart, since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. 
For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory is like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. So put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up into salvation. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. The grass indeed withers and the flower does fade. But these words of our God will stand forever. Let's pray. Father, would you give to us now a spirit of wisdom and revelation by knowing you through your authoritative, inspired, and infallible word. And would you increase our hunger for it, our conformity to it, and our proclamation of it in a world that needs to hear it. Amen. Be seated. Some of you may know bits of my story before coming to New St. Peter's, but there, there are aspects of it that I tend to keep to myself. But my inner Jim Pachta has me here this morning ready to see how the Lord wants to redeem every aspect of my story and use it for His glory. So we're going to venture into some territory that may be uncomfortable for me. So for several years in my late teens and early 20s, I spent much of my time living in a van with three or four of my closest friends in order to travel around the country as a touring musician. And these were the days before Spotify and other streaming services when the way that people discovered new artists was through a group coming through their town And so for several years, my friends and I lived a very transitory lifestyle. Uh, We would move from city to city each night, sleeping on people's couches or in the back of our van or something like that. We would eat peanut butter and jelly sandwiches or instant ramen noodles, showering at truck stops or campsites or wherever we could. It was actually kind of a non-hygienic lifestyle that would be pretty frowned upon in these days, and, uh, and, and I could tell you stories, or maybe I should say I could tell you some stories from those days that might amuse you, but what I want to tell you this morning about life on the road is one overarching lesson that I learned, and that is this. Life on the road is unlike any other kind of life. That is, it's an utterly unique kind of lifestyle that entails unique attitudes and actions that would be considered outright odd under most circumstances. Let me give you one example. I cannot count the number of times that I said yes to the invitation of a complete stranger to sleep on their couch or living room floor. Like, in what sphere of life is that socially acceptable? For a stranger to invite you to their home for the night, and then for you being so desperate to have a place to sleep that you say yes, no questions asked. I don't know, maybe some of you had that experience, maybe you've been on a backpacking trip or something, and you've had that kind of experience, but it's the kind of thing that only happens on the road. Or how about this one? Have you ever gone to a mall food court at closing time to beg for all of the leftover food? Maybe you've had that experience. Maybe you've been truly hungry before. I tend to think that most of us haven't. And really, myself, compared to a global perspective on hunger, I never was either. But that's something I've never done since. It was an experience that was totally reserved for life on the road when you're just in survival mode. It was, for that season, a unique and outright strange kind of life because life on the road looks different than life in a settled place. Your attitudes and actions must be different. Your self-understanding must be different. Your, the, the way that you understand and see the vision of your destination must be different. And I think that's a little bit like what Peter is getting at here in our passage today when he speaks to these elect exiles about how they are to live in light of their exilic identity. In other words, Peter says, if you are exiles, 
If you are strangers in a foreign land on your way to your final home in God, then your life must look different. He tells them that the call of of Christian holiness arises from the gospel identity of the exilic community. So there are distinct attitudes and actions and appetites that must mark God's exilic community. And so often they will be set in contrast to the attitudes and actions and appetites of the culture around them. So look where Peter starts with this idea. He tells us that there is something unique about exilic hope. Peter connects this section dealing with holiness or this section of imperatives to all that has come before. This, this of course, is the biblical pattern. The imperatives follow the indicatives or what we are called to do is most often followed by the proclamation of who we are in Jesus. And so Peter says, Therefore, since you have this new identity in Christ, and since your inheritance is secure, set your hope on that future grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And helpfully, he gives us two metaphors here for what such a hope will look like on the ground. He says, prepare your minds for action, or literally, gird up the loins of your mind. In other words, be ready, stay vigilant. Hope is not a passive reality for the exile, it's an active one. So, we're not called to passive disengagement as exiles in a foreign land, we're called to be ready for action. But then look how Peter qualifies this kind of active hope. He says, you are to be sober-minded. That is, you are to be self-controlled or well-composed in mind. You are to be grounded, or as the New Testament would elsewhere exhort, not not tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. Be sober-minded. I want you to see, right right out of the gate here, the the remarkable balance and the contrast that this kind of acting, this kind of active hope would provide in our day. We've said that life on the road looks a little bit different. That is, life as Christian exiles will elicit contrasting attitudes and actions from the culture around us. So how is this kind of hoping different from the world around us. I would suggest two contrasts. First, as we've said, it's remarkably balanced. As Peter calls us here to be both ready for action and sober-minded. Do you realize how strange that might look in our world today? In a reactionary culture of outrage? Or over against another kind of culture that sees the present calls to action for social justice as merely an overreaction. No, Peter's not calling for either extreme here. He's saying, be ready to act for the sake of gospel hope, for the good of the place that God has planted you. And as you do, be sober-minded. Now... Sobriety of mind is not to be confused with passivity or neglect of the immediate needs around us. That's not what Peter's calling us to here. But it does mean that our impulse to speak and act must be coupled with self-control. We could think about it this way. What, What might Christian social media groups look like if sobriety of mind was practiced before we post? Or even more important, what might your neighbors see if you practice such a sobriety of mind coupled with a readiness to see the good, uh, to see the gospel take root in your neighborhood? What a helpful balance. And what a contrast that might be as we live life on the road in exile. But the second way that this kind of hope contrasts is more ultimate. It's a contrast in object or ultimate end. Peter says, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you. So realize what Peter's saying here, that your hope as exiles must be set fully, that is exclusively on the consummation of God's redemptive purposes. 
So, as you look to the world around you, do you see brokenness? Clearly. Clearly. So where do you place your hope for a cure? Is it in a candidate? Or a movement? Or a relationship? Or a media outlet? None of those things are inherently fruitless as a means to seeking justice in the place that God has planted you. But not one of those things can rise to the level of ultimacy required to give you the hope for the redemption of this broken world. Only the consummation of God's purposes in the gospel can do that. And so, as exiles, your hope must be set in a different place. So, friends, can I ask a hard question this morning? Where would your neighbors say that your hope is placed? Where would those who peruse your Facebook feed say that your hope is placed? Where would your children say that your hope is placed? Those might be helpful diagnostic questions, and they might mean that we need to reevaluate, as Peter calls us to, how our ultimate hope compels our practical holiness. So Peter goes on to explain that life on the road for the Christian exile also comes with a distinct exilic holiness. As Noah pointed out earlier, when God calls his people to holiness, it's always in the context of redemption. Uh, so, so, so it was in the Levitical law, which Peter quotes here, and so it is in the gospel of Jesus. This holiness is, is, in, is set in the context of redemption, and it's, it, it's compelled by the very character of God. But I want you to notice from verses 14 to 22 that there, there really are two ways that Peter qualifies this kind of holiness. Again, helping us to see what is distinct about Christian holiness in exile. And the first thing he says is it involves fear. Look at verse 17. And if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. What does this mean? Are we to be afraid of God as our just judge, even though we've been justified by faith in Christ alone? Not exactly. That's not what Peter's getting at here. Nor is it what the New Testament refers to when it talks about Christians, you and me, standing before the judgment seat of Christ. No, our final justification on the day when we stand before the throne of Jesus is based on his obedience, not ours. Not some justification by works added to an initial saving faith. But neither does this truth remove our accountability before God on the day of judgment. We will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And as Ed Clowney so poignantly explains, he will pronounce for all the redeemed the satisfaction of Christ's atoning death and the merit of his perfect obedience Yet the faithfulness of the Lord's people will also be displayed, not as the basis of their acceptance, but to show the reality of their faith in the Savior. And so Peter here does not call us to some soul-crushing dread. The judge on the last day is our Father, who loves us perfectly in Jesus. But he does call us to a reverent fear. Because the Father is our holy God. So the question is, what does this kind of fear look like? How does it contribute to this idea that life on the road is set in contrast often to the culture around us? Well, look at verse 18. Knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold. So, Peter says, you have been ransomed from something, the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers. Now, here Peter is referring to the pagan idolatry that existed for generations in these Gentile cultures. Those traditions and practices which had been passed down through generational idolatry. And he says, you've been rescued from those things. You worship someone different now. 
It occurs to me that in our day, we're, we are involved in a cultural discussion about tradition and idolatry. Maybe you don't see it that way, but consider this. This week, Ligon Duncan, the Chancellor of Reformed Theological Seminary, who was with us in this pulpit just about a year ago this time, he was called upon by the Lieutenant Governor of the State of Mississippi to speak on the issue of the Mississippi State Flag which of course includes the symbol of the Confederate flag within it. And as Ligon shared his reflections, he, is, he explained his Southern heritage and his respect for many things handed down by his ancestors. He was not advocating for an erasing of tradition. But then he explained two simple truths which compelled him to advocate for the removal of the Mississippi state flag, and and they're pretty simple. They are these. Love for one's neighbor and the dignity of every man and woman made in the image of God. He noted that if you are a gospel-loving Christian, this issue is pretty straightforward from a biblical perspective. And then he said this so wisely. He said, for some of our citizens, this will mean parting with symbols they love. But that, too, is part of the Christian life. Jesus taught us to deny ourselves and take up our cross and follow him. In other words, that's life on the road. You see, the gospel is not opposed to culture. The gospel is opposed to idolatry. And when cultural symbols become so beloved that they are held in higher esteem than love for one's neighbor and the image of God in every man and woman, they have become idols. And the gospel is opposed to idolatry. Dr. Duncan, perhaps taking his cues from Peter, has already hit on the second way that Peter has qualified holiness here. And he he says it looks like love for one's neighbor. Look at verse 22. Since you have purified your souls by obedience to the truth, that is, since you have been born again by the word of God in the gospel, love one another. Love one another sincerely or literally unhypocritically. Love one another for the sake of the other. Love one another because you have been shown the love of God in that you have been born again by his living and abiding word. Now, Isn't it interesting here that Peter says a lot about holiness? He has a lot to say about it, but how has he really summed it up? What does it look like? It looks like fear of God and love for one another. Sounds a lot like something you might have learned from Jesus himself, doesn't it? Is it really that simple? Is is holiness in exile unique simply because of love for God and love for one's neighbor? I would submit to you this morning that it really is that simple, at least according to Scripture, but that it is not therefore easy. What does loving your neighbor look like in today's culture? Well, many would say that it looks like tolerance or acceptance. Others would say it looks like harsh and public condemnation of certain sins. Some would suggest it looks like corporate repentance or even reparations for past sins. Some would suggest it looks like protest or others that it looks like condemning civil unrest. But can I suggest to you a a different kind of category as you think through these, these things? And that is this. Why is the fear of the Lord logically prior to love for one's neighbor. Why, in Leviticus 19, as was read to us earlier, and and, and throughout Scripture, why is the order, I am the Lord your God, worship me, and therefore love your neighbor? Why is that always the order? It's because holiness is first about who our God is, and secondarily about what stance we might take on a particular issue. In other words, it is a matter of lordship 
before it is a matter of an opinion or even a particular theological view on an issue. And I think we are so tempted often to get that backwards in our day. That's why, by the way, Peter tells us that exilic holiness is driven by a unique exilic hunger. Look at chapter 2, verse 1. In order to love one another, there are things we must seek to put away. Malice and deceit and hypocrisy and envy and slander. But look what takes their place. A craving for the pure spiritual milk of God's word. Peter gives us this simple and profound illustration. Like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk. It's a word picture I'm not unfamiliar with these days from an observer's perspective. His point is that newborn infants are uniquely and solely dependent on their mother's milk. They crave it singularly. It's their very life. And notice, it is pure spiritual milk, not not tainted and not compounded with mere human wisdom. And just what is that milk? Well, certainly it's the Word of God in all of Scripture, but I hope that you've noticed the emphasis throughout this text on the power of God's Word in the Gospel message. Verse 22, you've been born again through the living and abiding Word of God. In verse 25, this Word is the good news that was preached to you. And here in verse 2, the Word in which you grow up into salvation, the central Gospel message that all of Scripture proclaims. That is the milk that you are to crave. The gospel, as many have pointed out, is not just the ABCs of Christianity. It is, of course, the A to Z. It is, according to Paul, the power of God for salvation and the wisdom of God which makes foolish the wisdom of this world. In other words, and hear this, it is the central point of contrast when it comes to life on the road. It is exactly the point where Christian exiles will be distinct from the world around them because it's utter foolishness to a perishing world. It is opposed to worldly, fallen wisdom, not first because it takes one side or another on particular issues, but because it is the very word of the supreme Lord of the universe. And here's where I think we can get the order wrong, as I said a moment ago. The kind of hunger that uniquely marks the Christian exile on the road is a hunger for God's word as such and not a hunger for God's word to validate your own views on a particular issue. In other words, the gospel should very well lead us to certain convictions about life and culture in our world and it should lead us to theological positions. But it should do so not in conformity to a particular set of convictions or even a particular theological position, but because it is God's authoritative word for his people. The supreme Lord of the universe has spoken and by his wisdom, he has made foolish the wisdom of this world. And that must mean that the unique hunger that marks the Christian exile will rub up against the wisdom of the world in some difficult ways. And yet, the problem so often is we cannot deal with the discomfort of God's word rubbing up against the wisdom of this world, no matter which party it's associated with. And unfortunately, in our day, if you are uncomfortable with the wisdom of God in the gospel, there are plenty of other places you could turn to find a more palatable kind of wisdom. In a day when everyone has a blog and when an internet article is held in equal esteem as the preaching of God's authoritative word, you can pretty much find any kind of wisdom out there to relieve your discomfort. Yet an exilic hunger for God's word in the gospel says that unless he has spoken, we have nothing unique to say. And that because he has spoken in the person of Jesus the King, we must submit ourselves to his lordship over against the supposed wisdom of the world. 
Look, this is why Peter is so concerned to talk about persecution in these letters, because he knows it will come if you adopt this kind of posture. He knows that life on the road will bring with it misunderstanding and ridicule and undue slander and even physical persecution, the likes of which our brothers and sisters in places around the world are experiencing even now. He knows that the transformation that has taken place in us because of the gospel looks a whole lot like a departure, like a setting out, like a leaving behind the feudal idols handed down from your forefathers, and like following Jesus Christ who calls us onward and upward even as we sojourn here, and who nourishes us along the way with the countercultural life-transforming word of his gospel. And so our cravings on the road are unique. Exiles crave the word of God over all other modes of wisdom. Life on the road is just different, isn't it? So here's how I want to close this morning, by asking you to consider this question. Are you on the road? Do do you see yourself as an exile on your way to a better country, yet sojourning in this one? Do you find that your cravings and attitudes and hopes make you long all the more for the fullness of grace to be revealed to you at Jesus' return? Or are you already home? We've talked about this many times before. The Christian journey is marked by a certain homesickness which recognizes that the comfort offered here and now pales in comparison to that which is to come in glory. But I wonder, in a city that is so obsessed with comfort and glory here and now, I wonder if we've settled into our lives of complacency and unholy contentment. I urge you this morning, friends, as I urge myself, being sober-minded and ready for action, set your hope fully on the grace that is yet future, the grace to be revealed when Jesus comes to complete our journey, ushering us to our final home. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, let's pray. Lord Jesus, you are King, and your kingdom is not of this world. And so often you call us in difficult ways to set our hopes on things that are not of this world. And so often that looks different than uh, the way that our neighbors hope and the way that they act. And so often we're confused about the balance. How do we love our neighbors and how do we uh, live in these kinds of tensions? Would you give us great wisdom uh, and great help by your spirit to do this for your glory, knowing that we have been ransomed from our futile ways? Would you help us to live this life as Christian exiles on the road, live it in holiness, and live it unto your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. And now as we prepare to come to the communion table, together with exiles from every time and place, Christian, what is it that you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, And in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. This meal is meant to stoke our hunger for the truths of God in the gospel. Jesus told us as much when he instituted it, saying that as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you do this in remembrance of me. It's a meal that we partake in with hopeful expectancy, for it foreshadows that final meal that we will have with him upon his return. But in this meal is held out not only future hope and past remembrance, but also real and present grace. 
For Jesus meets with us here and nourishes our souls. For this reason, if Christ is your hope, come and partake. But if the life and death of Jesus is not your hope for salvation, we ask that you refrain from eating and drinking here. Instead, consider the offer of Jesus on display for you if you would receive it by faith. Many of you have done this before in recent weeks, but as you prepare to come to the communion tables, instructions will be laid out for you on page 7 of your bulletin. We'll come as a family unit. Noah and I will be wearing masks so that when you come to the table, you can remove yours and, and partake of the elements. This morning, being a fourth Sunday, we are, our deacons are collecting alms, and usually one of our deacons would give an announcement about that and some instruction there. And there are several deacons here this morning if you want to ask them about how our alms have been used or if you have questions or, uh, or, or needs in, in those regards, please seek those men out. Their names are on the back of the bulletin, even those new deacons that were just installed and ordained last week. But this week, uh, we're going to proceed with our communion liturgy. And if you would like to give alms, there are bowls located just on the, the sides, just on the wings here. So as you wait to come to the table as you pass those bowls by. Those bowls will be for alms, and the bowls right, the bowl singular right in the middle there will be for your offering. And so I encourage you in those regards. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Here, where the ransomed meet, we glimpse the city of the forgiven, gathered from a thousand lands afar. Come and dine with Christ ascended. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice. Here where his death is shown forth, we glimpse the harbor of eternal rest, where sickness, sin, and sorrow are no more. And so come to the table and renew your hope in Jesus' return. Come to the table and find rest in Jesus' sacrifice once for all. Come to the table and taste the goodness of our Lord, even in exile. Come to the table.
that drove the bitter nails and hung him on that judgment tree. I will glory in my Redeemer who crushed the power of sin and death. My only Savior before the Holy Judge, the Lamb who is my righteousness, the Lamb who is my righteousness.
you as we conclude this morning that after the benediction, would you please proceed, if you're not part of Teardown crew, would you please proceed outside under the portico. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. We have tasted and seen that the Lord is good. Let us long like newborn infants for pure spiritual milk that by it we may grow up into salvation. Now to him who is able to strengthen you according to the gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but has now been disclosed through the prophetic writings, has been made known to all nations, according to the command of the eternal God to bring about the obedience of faith. To the only wise God be glory forevermore through Jesus Christ. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Amen.